The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, loud trumpets heard at sunrise result of rift in dimensions to universe where trumpets are weapons of mass destruction. The bad news is that evil aliens are invading, but the good news is they all use silly Dr. Seuss instruments instead of machine guns. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part one of a two-part interview with the very interesting and entertaining D.J. Butler, who discusses Witchy Winter, book two in the Witchy War saga, and the sequel to Witchy Eye. Dave Butler talks about how he conceived and created his unique world set in Jacksonian America, where all the magic systems of the continent's population, migrants and natives alike, both work and come into play in the story in a big way. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leaden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. Now here's the news. Hey, the April contest is ready, set, going, going, going... In his new novel, Witchy Winter, D.J. Butler reimagines American history with a touch of the fantastic. Butler is also an accomplished singer-songwriter who has released an album of songs inspired with the world of Witchy Winter and its prequel, Witchy Eye. Hey, we played those on this podcast, a few of those, at one point uh, last year, and that was really cool. Which got us thinking, how might some of America's beloved patriotic songs sound with a fantasy twist, or maybe a science fiction twist. So we're asking you to write a classic patriotic tune with fantasy-inspired lyrics, or maybe science fiction-inspired lyrics. Would Yankee Doodle Dandy be a wizard? Would those purple mountains hide a dragon's hoard? Give us your take for a chance to win a signed copy of both Witchy Eye and Witchy Winter. Come on and enter. You know you wanna. Send your entry to contest at bain.com. Do that no later than April 20th and put April contest in the subject field. And please remember to include your name because we will need to contact you. One entry per person, please. Winner will be selected by the Bain editorial staff and the winning entry may be published as part of the announcement and I'm sure will be published. So come up with something cool and send it in and we'll give you a free signed book as a reward for your amazing creativity. This is part one of a two-part interview with D.J. Butler discussing fantasy novel Witchy Winter. Part two will be available on next week's podcast. I want to welcome D.J. Butler, Dave Butler, uh, to the podcast. Hello. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Again, uh, DJ Butler grew up in swamps, deserts, and mountains. After messing around for years with the practice of law, he finally got serious and turned to his lifelong passion of storytelling. He now writes adventure stories for readers of all ages, plays guitar, and we have heard that on the podcast, as a matter of fact, and uh, spends as much time as he can with his family. He is the author of City of the Saints, Rock Band Fights Evil, Space Eldritch, and uh, Kreshling from Wordfire Press. These are, uh, I believe, YAs. And Witchy Eye from Bane Books uh, from last year. Right now at booksellers everywhere is Witchy Winter, the sequel to Witchy Eye. Um, so, Dave, where are we? What happened in Witchy Eye? What... This, uh, Sarah seems to be on her way to uh, to claim her heritage and to have, have found out who she is. Who is she? Well, uh, so uh, that's a really good question. Uh, because ultimately there are spoilers there for book three uh, and, and, and beyond. If I give too big an answer, but I'll say this. Uh, her father is. Her father was the. Uh, well, her mother was the pen landholder and elected empress um, of the uh, New World Empire. Her her father was a sort of a uh, 
was a king, um, and, and not just a political king, but a king who exists in a kind of a magical or sacral kingship uh, that has uh, that has um, that has a symbiotic relationship, uh, a kind of a, a kind of a covenant relationship with the destructive and also beneficent god of the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers. So uh, Sarah Sarah is heir to a to a commitment uh, of, uh, of rule, but also of self sacrifice to uh, to stop the mad, violent, destructive uh, apparition uh, or, or uh, appearance of that divinity, uh, commonly known as Simon Sword. Uh-huh. The um, well, half the half of the book is um, is a. Uh, we're wondering whether Simon Sword and the Heron King uh, and uh, Peter Plowshare, which is which is all of these sort of uh, folk gods that you've you've brought forth from American uh, uh, folklore, are the same or different. And Sarah's trying to figure this. Let's let's talk about the setup a little bit of this. The milieu is so important in understanding. Uh, what's going on and it is extremely complex but yet so incredibly cool that it's worth talking about at some length um in fact uh you might refer everyone to your essay that uh that that talks about some of the the real resources that you use to uh to develop the milieu can you i don't know how, where we want to begin but let's let's uh let's talk about the milieu yeah let me let me uh let me approach it by um, chronologically by kind of how I found it, which is to say, how, how did I get the idea for this setting um, and and this story? Um, and I I knew uh, I had been I'd been considering think for a time about a story of three siblings with uh, with strange uh, deformities and a kind of a strange inheritance from their father. Ultimately, this comes from. This comes from uh, my children, uh, and uh, the the title Witchy Eye, for example, really comes from is a nickname that I called my my second child, my oldest daughter, uh, when she was a few weeks old. My brother was was you know making baby talk with her, uh, and 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 suddenly raised an alarm because her pupils were different sizes. And uh, and um, and we rushed in and we talked to the doctor. It turns out there's nothing nothing wrong. I think it's called Horner syndrome. She just has pupils that dilate at a different rate. There's no there's no harm. It's not a symptom of anything that hurts her. Um, but I started calling her witchy eye when she was a child, and my my oldest was born with an ear stuck to the side of his head that has never fully flattened out like the other. So he has he has asymmetrical ears. So this this was originally the idea, and I was looking for a setting, and I read several books at the same time, uh, and and uh, I, I mean I'm a firm believer that uh, creativity, whether whether it's conscious or not, is ultimately the the result of you consuming lots of ideas and images and stories and information, and then consciously and also unconsciously. Uh, rearranging that, um, and uh, so a couple things. One, I had been, I had been reading uh, my my kids the Brothers Grimm fairy tales, uh, and uh, and happened at the same time to read. I think it was uh, oh I forget the author, but a uh, uh, Wedgwood C. V. Wedgwood's History of the Thirty Years' War. Which had just come up on my Amazon wish list, and I and I, I I bought it, and I and I I realized something that I was sort of embarrassingly late to realize. I mean, I was in my 30s, and I I finally understood what the setting for the Brothers Grimm was. As this, it was a setting that I'd always liked because there's this there's this um, from my point of view, it feels very whimsical where you where you can have a Lord Mayor, but also an Emperor and a Princess. Uh, and you know the bishop landowner kind of all in the same setting. It it, it feels uh, it feels it's sort of intrinsically fairy tale to me. Well, it turns out that's just early modern Germany is is what that is. Mm-hmm. Which I just uh, like I say, it's a little embarrassing that it was in my 30s that I put this together. 
so for a while, I thought that would be the setting. Um, and I was sort of working on this, this fairy tale story uh, about three children and their missing father and, uh, and their sort of three sort of curses but sort of gifts from their father. Uh, and then I read a, um, a work of American history, sort of uh, historical anthropology, called Albion Seed mm-hmm. by the historian David Hackett Fisher. Yeah, now that's that's a that's a great book. Uh, Wedgwood's book was famous this time, but yeah, Albion Seed's amazing. Um, and uh, if you haven't read it, it's it's nine hundred pages long, and the basic argument is we oversimplify when we say that there was a, a migration from England to North America because in fact there were multiple migrations and they brought utterly distinctive cultures uh, well utterly is too much they brought strongly distinctive cultures uh, each of these four migrations so the earliest is the uh, Puritans that come from Southeast England they're an oppressed minority so they flee and they come to Massachusetts Bay um, uh, and set up shop so they can oppress everybody else, right? Um, but then, but then Oliver Cromwell comes to power, so some of them go back because England is more hospitable to them, um, and correspondingly, it's less hospitable to the to the royalists um, who are especially so, strong in sort of southwest England, uh, the old uh, you know kingdom of King Alfred. Uh, and, and so you get a migration that comes to America. Well, the Massachusetts Bay is full, so they come down to the Chesapeake. Uh, this is sort of cavalier royalist um, uh, migration, and they are distinctive in uh, names and agriculture uh, and, and architecture and wedding practices and ideas about death and religion. Uh, and, uh, and they speak English, but you know, even the English, uh, they, they bring different names, different words with them, different terms for things. So, um, and then, and then, and then later we have, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the land grant to, uh, William Penn and the Quaker migration that comes up the Delaware river and into Pennsylvania, uh, where it inherits a kind of interesting multicultural society that, the Dutch and Swedish traders and Lenny Lenape had already had this great tradition of mutual, uh, mostly mutual toleration and respect, and then the Quakers moved right in. Uh, and then later, yeah. of course, the the North British borderers is what he calls them. Scotch-Irish is a very common uh, name also, but the people who lived in, in uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland and the borders of England and Scotland, um, uh, who who come and they find that the the coasts are are full of uh, English speaking people already, so they keep going and they come to the Appalachian Mountains, and and it's a it's a book that describes those cultures in minute detail, and it has uh, drawings of typical houses and clothing and uh, fa- fantastic book, and I and I read this book Albion Seed, and I thought. Why are fantasy books not this good? Why why are role playing game setting books not this detailed? You know, we we get we get so much less. We get people with pointy ears and they live a long time and they like songs and fruit juice, right? You know, uh, we don't get this kind of just nitty gritty detail. And 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 I thought I'd like to write a setting like that. And then I thought, no, no, this this is my setting. This is what I should start with. And I put this. I put the story I'd been noodling on with the setting of um, North America. Kind of, kind of worked around trying to find a time that I, that I liked, and ultimately found uh, the year 1815. And uh, most of the most of the cultures that that made up the real historical North America are there. Uh, some of them have basically followed the the historical pattern of their arrival. Some of them have come by very different uh, means. And, and rather than being organized as a, you know, a federal republic, uh, they're organized as an empire with an elective emperor, uh, which is to say uh, something modeled on the Holy Roman Empire. Although the Holy Roman Empire grew up organically, really, as the sort of personal land holding uh, of the Habsburgs over hundreds of years, 
the New World Empire is built, uh, is created in a, in a document, a 1784 Philadelphia compact uh, engineered by uh, the landholder, the great Penn landholder, John Penn, and the lightning bishop, Benjamin Franklin. So that's, that's a lot of me talking, but it's, but it's to say um, the, the setting is distinctive for being uh, Jacksonian America, um, and on an epic scale, and I re- and I really want, I love the detail that makes the story and the world feel real to me, and so I work hard to uh, to get it in there. Yeah, I mean, and you've gone beyond Albion Seed as well, because there is um, all kind of cool stuff about voodoo and in, uh, in the New Orleans segments of the of the book. Um, and uh, you you get a lot of Native American uh, uh, myth and folklore in there as well. It's just really cool. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's America, um, the magic systems and folk stories um, of all of all of us that are here. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's absolutely the goal uh, of all of us. And uh, yeah, the Native American stuff's been fun. I, I like languages, and, and one of the challenges is that so many of the Native American languages are are basically lost. There, there are no speakers left, or there are very few, and there are no learning materials. So there was, uh, or there are very little. So so I was. Book two, which he winter starts out with a new character uh, who's, uh, who's an Ojibwe, a Chippewa man named uh, Mayangan. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a couple of years learning a little bit of Ojibwe uh, to be able to, uh, to try and write him well, you know, respectfully, interestingly. Um, uh, accurately is not exactly the right word because it's a fantasy story, you know. But but uh, but to be a faithful mirror to reality. Yeah. Well, he's really he's it's really a fun uh, opening chapter in that he has two children, uh, and and there's sort of like this football match with the baby, the first baby, <laughs> to to see whose clan it belongs to, right? And then. Uh, Yep. The second baby, like nobody realizes it came, <laughs> or yep. um, and and the book starts out with his quest to find a name, uh, uh, a a sense of rootedness for that child because he loves it, and but it doesn't, uh, it's, it's unclaimed by by the people yet, right? Yep, exactly. There's a there's a ritual fault, and this is uh, no, I I had to say I don't know. To what extent people do this still? I would love to imagine that, that this still happens. But uh, Francis Densmore um, wrote an early account, which is still published by I think it's the Minnesota Historical Society, and I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's called Chippewa Customs about uh, the way of life uh, of of the Minnesota Ojibwe and. And, and this is this is something that she talks about, that at the birth of a child, there is a mock kidnapping, and it's got a predetermined end. Uh, be, be, well, actually, more basic than that, um, the, the Ojibwe, and I believe this is true of other Algonquin peoples, have a clan system uh, or, or a, a dodem or a totem where you, you belong to a, a clan, the loon clan, or or uh, the marten, or the, or the fish, uh, and uh, and that's not that's not necessarily the people you live with. That's sort of a conceptual lineage, and you might have several dodems, several clans present in a single village or or a single uh, you know a tribe, a living a living group. Um, but it determines things like uh, marriage. You you don't marry your own dodem. You marry someone else. So. Uh, so the, the husband and wife are, are always of a different clan, even though they live in the same tribe, the same village. Uh, and there's a there's a ritual mock combat at the birth of a child, and, and the predetermined ending is the father has to win. That's how it's supposed to work. But but yes, it's a football match with the baby. You grab the baby and you run around and you throw water at people and you wrestle and you you throw flour on them. Um, and uh, that was a it was a delight. To, to write, uh, but but this one goes badly because no one knows who's a second baby, and so 
the child, uh, the first child, is 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 uh, has the appropriate birth ritual and becomes one of the people, and the second does not. And although they try to fix it, they try to make it up. He doesn't prosper. He suffers, and that uh, that ultimately is what uh, sends Mind Gun on a quest that involves him with uh, with Sarah and our other characters from book one. Yeah, and he is his his manitou tells him to go find this healer who will know how to how to fix the kid, and that is one of the three children of Mad Empress Helen Penn. <laughs> Which is, uh, and, w- and one of the other children is, is Sarah, um, is, yep. and Thomas Penn, let's get, let's talk about one of the bad guys who I think is very scary, <laughs> kind of Valdemortian, uh, he is, I don't know if he's a bad guy, but yeah, he is a bad guy. <laughs> he, uh, he does not want, uh, Sarah to come into her own for, for sure. Um, he is the, uh. He's, he's kind of the emperor of everything east of uh, the Appalachians, right? Yep. And it's like east of the Mississippi. Uh, and, and, and he's uh, all identified with I, these um, astrological sign of Jupiter. And what is that magic system, I wanted to ask you? Yeah. If you read uh, classical, um, some, of the, some of the biggest... Uh, um, Grimoire, books of books of magic from the Middle Ages, uh, the Picatrix, for example, or Henry, Henry Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. Um, there are different kinds of astrology. So there is uh, there's the casting of nativities, right? Somebody's born, and you go look at their the day they're born and where the stars and planets are, and you and you tell a kind of a future for them. Um, there's also uh, judgments where you are, where you are judicial astrology, where you are trying to determine auspicious days to do things. But uh, but a, a, a third kind of astrology is the uh, is the use uh, of signs to capture the power um, of of stars and planets. So uh, so uh, each of the each of the planets, uh, uh, the horoscopes, they have associations with certain materials and with certain kinds of glyphs or images uh, and, uh, and with certain days. And the idea is that, uh, well, the, ultimately the idea is that as above, so below, the things that happen in heaven have influence on earth uh, or are repeated on earth. And so if I want to have power on earth, I need to capture the the power of heaven and so one way to do that is you when at the right time when when jupiter is you know in a in a in the right alignment with the sun uh, and it's the right day of the week also and at the right hour and i use the metal associated with jupiter and i you know capture on it uh the you know a, a, a painting so each of these each of these figures the the planets and, and the zodiacal the zodiacal signs have traditional uh, representations, images, what they look like. Uh, and I paint a kind of portrait of Jupiter, and uh, you know there are signs of Jupiter, and and that captures in the object Jupiter's influence, so that I can use it later. Uh, and you know Mars and Mercury, and, and they have different kinds of influences you can exert. So yeah, Thomas, one of the first things we hear about him. Is uh, is uh, in book one when his people are his people his his elite bodyguard the Philadelphia Blues are laying siege to Calhoun Mountain. Uh, Iron Andy Calhoun, the Elector, is is yelling down at the Imperials, telling him to go away, uh, and he refers to uh, refers to Thomas as a Caldee numbskull. Says I voted against that Caldee numbskull, and that's a uh, that's an old, an old way, ultimately coming from the Bible, to refer to an astrologer or someone obsessed with astrology as a Chaldee or a Chaldean, uh, and he is. He he uh, he's obsessed with power. Uh, he believes himself uh, right, uh, capable of of benefiting others and bringing good to uh, his ruled people, but only if he's allowed to rule. And, and he'll go so far as to uh, kill his sister. Uh, to take power, 
and he absolutely wants to kill uh, his his niece, uh, his nieces, and his nephew when he learns they exist. Yeah, his sister would be is is Helen, um, and she's um, she's the one that married the. Uh... Well, let's start, let's talk about Thomas a little more before we move on to to that. Um, he is he's in a weird relationship with his uh, the spirit of his uh, ancestor that that's incredibly creepy um it's almost like uh he's he's being bossed around by a demon ghost yeah uh and he basically is uh ultimately because of his his uh his pride and his will to rule ultimately it's his will to rule that enslaves him um and and he does believe uh, that he is uh, communing with the spirit of uh, William Penn. Um, and I don't want to say too much to spoil book two, so I will leave it at that. Uh, he, and that is what he believes, and the result is that he is manipulated. And he's going to be, uh, I mean, he's, he's a bad guy when he comes on the screen. He's committed crimes, but he's going to be led to commit uh, worse, an attempt to commit worse and worse uh, atrocities, believing that the benevolent spirit of William Penn has chosen him, and is going, he's going to complete the the mission of William Penn. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's scary, and uh, and when one imagines he's going to uh, to to play a big part in Book Three as well. So, um, so well, uh, one other pair that are interesting in the, as far as the uh, the the minions of Penn are uh, Sh- are are Schmidt and what is her first name again? It's really it's like a Quaker first name or something. Withstanding Schmidt. Not not withstanding Schmidt. And uh, withstanding Schmidt. And her uh, her personal uh, magic man uh, Lundum. Uh, they are because he uses he he uses a lot of magic systems, but one of them that he knows a lot about is uh, is Brokurai, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. What is that? A lot. I think a lot of people will not know that term, and uh, it just hasn't appeared that much in fantasy. No, it hasn't, which is really to our loss. Uh, voodoo has has made much more appearance in popular consciousness. Um, in I think probably mostly caricature kind of form. Um, I think it's I think it's very vivid, uh, uh, and and frankly, there's probably some kind of race and class dynamics there too, where it's very, you know, it's, it's sort of horrifying to think that oh, here's this this sort of foreign dark magic from Africa kind of thing. Um, but uh, Brokurai less so, which is a shame. So. Um, yeah. So, what is Braukerei? Well, Braukerei is uh, is a German uh, tradition. Um, a Brauker might actually not uh, might tell you that he's not a magician. Uh, he might say, "No, what I what I do is a kind of prayer," um, uh, and and uh, which which may be true. It's hard to draw the line there. But but when you have a prayer that has fixed words and you make gestures at a certain moment, and it's designed to accomplish a specific end, like make my bullet more accurate, uh, or uh, uh, you know, silence the tongue of a barking dog. It it feels an awful lot like magic. So it's a it's a tradition of kind of German wizardry that exists in Pennsylvania in German Pennsylvania uh, today. Uh, and uh, you know, a Brauker is uh, the idea of the visit is a kind of service. So a Brauker is not for hire. A uh, Brauker is someone who learned from, uh, and also a Brauker can't, can't earn money, but also can't help your own kin. It's meant to be, you can't, that would be benefiting yourself. So you have to benefit, you have to serve others. You, you exist, you, you live, you learn, you learn the art of Brauker, I, Hexer, I, to, to be able to serve. Uh, and, uh, and Brauker, I was, was, uh, was at one time huge, the biggest selling American grimoire ever published, like native to this continent, is a, a Braukerai manual called The Long Lost Friend by a writer named uh, John George Homan, published in, I think, about the year 1830, 1835. 
uh, films over there. So, so Lumen Walters is a character uh, who's new. He and Schmidt are both new to book two, uh, and they're Imperials. Um, and uh, Lumen is uh, uh, Lumen feels quintessentially the outsider, and he also feels quintessentially uh, disempowered. Uh, he uh, he does not have the kind of magic that Sarah has innately. He, he doesn't have the ability to construct spells out of nothing, uh, and uh, and so instead he works very very hard um, at, at at learning uh, sort of more uh, more routine, simpler kinds of magics. He's a sort of a hedge wizard, and he's sort of a magical thief. He he likes to he tries to. Uh, get initiated into magical traditions, uh, into other people's magical traditions. So part of the backstory, uh, which which shows up in his really just in his thought, but the way he learned Brauchery is um, there's a there's a, a Brauchery near Youngstown who has uh, whose personal tradition requires him to pass on uh, his art to a, a female member of the family who will pass it on to a male, and so on. Uh, and he's old and blind, and, and he has no uh, no members of his family who are interested. Uh, Lumen pays his uh, one of his uh, granddaughters to pretend to be interested and sit there, but while the blind man teaches her, Lumen is taking all the notes uh, until she demands too much money and then has him has him run out of town on a rail. So uh, he's uh, uh, he 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 is the man who is not. Who is not an insider, uh, who is not in the know, and who very much wants to be. He's a he's a little bit like the character of Aaron Burr in Hamilton play, right? Um, except not in a political sense, in the sense of uh, magic or esoterica. He wants yeah. to be in the room where it happens. The uh, and he usually isn't. Yeah, it seems like um, you get to kind of like him, even though he is working for the bad guys. Um, and and Schmidt and Lewin are part of a of a marching force that's that's marching down the Ohio toward uh, Cahokia. Um, and it's it's uh, basically, they're calling it the pacification of the Ohio, which I take to mean that, um, <laughs> they're, that they're um, making sure that, uh, that, I mean, they're basically trying to prevent whatever, uh, whatever may happen at the serpent, uh, yeah. at the serpent throne. Right. Yeah. Because it's empty. Occupation force. Yeah. It's complete double talk. There's nothing to pacify, right? The, the unrest is a result of the pacification, not the other way around. Yeah. Another, I mean, we might mention it briefly, is uh, another cool thing is that you have the Hanseatic League um, all stretched in, down the river, uh, down the riverways of America as well, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So that's all. That was a. Uh, that was a lot of fun. They're a, they're a trading league. You know, you know, real America. America is huge. It's 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 geographically vast. Real world America is fantastically complex. You know, there are dozens of cultures that go into uh, creating uh, America uh, as we have it today. Um, and and the, our, we have a mass media culture. Uh, and historical narrative that just grossly oversimplifies, either because that's all it could do, or because that's what it wants to do. Um, and uh, and and so so again, to me, a big fantasy land can't have three peoples, right? We live in we live in the elf country. Ooh, now we're in the dwarf country. It has to have lots uh, and and uh, peoples with different kinds of organizations. So there's a there's a network. There's a there's a charter, uh, and towns uh, basically sign up to this charter, and they're they're a trading league, uh, and they have you know uh, their secret passwords and their rules for who can be a trader or not. And so part of what, uh, so notwithstanding Schmidt is one of the five directors of the Imperial uh, Ohio Company. It's the, it's the one. Of, there's also a Dutch uh, Ohio Company. Uh, the Imperial Ohio Company is uh, is owned by Thomas, owned by the Penn. Landholder, and so um, he is. Uh, Thomas is very wealthy, but the empire of which he is the head is um, is an empire with whose emperor is elected, 
and who has enumerated power. So he can't just round up huge numbers of, uh, of, of military for any reason. So as he, as he is trying to persuade the electors to give him uh, an army, and the pretext is the uprising in the Ohio, and, the, and that's why I have to send the pacification. Uh, the Ohio company, he's using them as a kind of militia to uh, do a few things. Uh, destroy the food uh, of, the, uh, of the, the seven mound builder kingdoms of the Ohio, oppress them, make them want to rebel, make, make them pick the fight. Uh, but also he has, to, he has to stop the league uh, and stop the Dutch company from from trading with the Ohioans, right? Because they have every incentive uh, of a sheer profit motive to, hey, uh, the, you know, the, these people are losing their food. They'll pay a lot, right? If I can just get them pumpkins or bread or whatever. So, yeah, she's coming down the Ohio River, uh, and, and some of what we see her do is uh, is is breaking Hansa towns and, and forcing them to be sidelined so they so they will not help. Yeah, she's pretty effective, which it makes her cool as a as a as a approaching uh, bad guy. Um, now, well, let's talk about um, the three uh, Mad Empress Helen, Helen Penn, um, married Curus Eleutherius, who is um, who's who's our our heroine Sarah's father and uh, the father of two other children who are very important in the novel. Um, and he is one of the eldritch one of the it, you might, might you might think of him as else i don't know um but they are from a, a separate line of humanity right yeah yes uh and uh people so people so the word human in fact doesn't appear in the books and uh, also the word america does not right uh, so people talk about the children of Adam, which encompasses both lines of humanity, uh, and then they distinguish those from the children of Eve, who are humans as you and I, uh, as you and I are, uh, and, uh, and then the children of the serpent or the children of wisdom, and there are, there are other kinds of uh, names and, and, and slurs uh, for the other group. And uh, and so a certain amount of the mythical, not a certain amount, a lot of the mythical prehistory for the story is tied into, and the legendary prehistory is tied into uh, the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, including the garden story. Uh, and so one of the big, I don't want to give away any reveals, but, but, but part of the climax of book two uh, is uh, Sarah uh, getting a glimpse into the garden itself and and what its who its occupant is uh, with sort of implications for what really is the difference between these two branches of humanity? That was part one of a two-part interview with D.J. Butler discussing fantasy novel Witchy Winter. Part two will be available on next week's podcast. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunist on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, 
the master trader's heir, and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Chapter 29 Langlast Port Broker Plichette met them at the door of the textile display room, belt pouches swinging with the briskness of his stride, his smile wide and toothy. Trader Yoskalen, welcome, and welcome as well to the master trader. You're both busy, I know, and too short a time to find all our port has on offer. If you'll just come right along behind me, I promised the trader a rare treat, and I'm determined that she has it. Looked it out on the overnight to be sure it was still in the bin. My luck, it was sold while I was enjoying your hospitality yesternoon. But no, we have it safe still. This way, then. He strode toward the door. It opened before him. Paddy looked at Father, who gestured her ahead of him. This is, after all, your contact, trader, he murmured. Pretend that I am not present. She nodded and followed the broker, though she couldn't help a glance over her shoulder at Father, who was walking with Mr. Higgs. At least, she thought with relief, he hadn't utterly disappeared, as he had done on Andiri. That had been a little too much not present for comfort. Right down here, traitor, a specialty. I thought of it when we were speaking, and I knew it for yours. It might have been wove just for you, and that's the truth of the thing. Right this way, a little bit of a walk, but you won't mind that. The broker was hurrying, in truth, his legs rather longer than Paddy's, though Corval was a tall clan, and she not the shortest of her kin. It might almost seem as if he was trying to force her into a run, but no, there was nothing for him to gain by straining her dignity. Very likely, he had simply not considered the disparity in their height and was making what haste he could because he was busy himself. Well then, she would compromise. She walked briskly in order to show respect for the broker's necessity, but not so briskly that she moved into a run. It would have been more to her taste to walk slowly, so that she might inspect the bins they sped past, but that was apparently not to be. And that was rather more than a pity. She would have liked to view the textiles, and especially the rugs on display, more closely. She quite liked rugs, and would have welcomed an opportunity to add something new to her inventory. Patty felt her temper flicker, drew a hard breath to cool it, and throttled down the sudden desire to simply turn around and walk back the way she had come, at precisely the same pace, and remove herself from this situation. Grandfather Lucan would never treat a visitor to his display room thus, she thought hotly. Broker Plichette was some distance ahead of her now, very nearly at the back of the room. Without even a glance behind him to be sure that she still followed, he turned a corner between two bins. Patty's temper went from hot to cold. She deliberately slowed her pace as she approached the corner where the broker had disappeared. Her hideaway was within reach, of course, but would it not be better, more prudent, to indeed turn and walk away from what had gone from mere rudeness to the possibility of an ambush? She heard a quiet step behind her, and a moment later, Father slipped his hand under her elbow. Gently, trader, he said, voice so soft that his words sounded like her own thought. I detect no maliciousness in the man, though he is clearly anticipatory regarding something. 
He may mean to frighten you, or it might be something else. But he does not mean to harm you. An advantage of being one of the Shah Dramlees, Paddy thought, to be able to see around corners and taste the tenor of a trading partner's emotions as negotiation proceeded. Those abilities might be valuable. If she came, Shah Dramlisa, or full Dramlisa, and was not made silly by the weight of her power like Aunt Anthora. And there really was no good to be had from thinking about Aunt Anthora at this precise moment. Paddy sighed and slowed her pace a bit more. Very proper, father said. There's no need to exhaust yourself at the beginning of a busy day. You called ahead. If he knew his schedule was too full to accommodate you, he might have refused the appointment then, or asked you to come to him at a more convenient hour. He paused, then spoke again very seriously. I do not think it is at all necessary, but I will mention that you have the option of asking Vanner to precede you around the corner. As if she couldn't take care of herself, she thought with a flare of temper. Then she thought again, and her temper cooled. It was a simple Melanti frame. Mr. Higgs was ship security. It was, therefore, his duty to precede people around dangerous corners. She was not here as Quinn's co-pilot. There were no babies to shield from heartless enemies. At Langlastport, her Melanti was traitor. A peaceable enough thing, or so she wished it to be. The corner was scarcely six of her slower steps ahead. The broker anticipated something, did he? Perhaps he anticipated her overreaction or her scream when he leapt out from the corner and cried, Boo! Well, perhaps she might spoil his game for him in balance for his rudeness. I think that I will not impose upon Mr. Higgs, she said. Father nodded and dropped a step behind her. Paddy rounded the corner. Sean considered the broker's pattern. Anticipation, yes. Some mischief, perhaps. Some determination, perhaps, to prove a point. Very occasionally, he wished that he were a true telepath, rather than a mere empath. Deciphering emotions was rather a nebulous business, never entirely accurate, and often raising more questions than were answered. On the other hand, one imagined a true telepath would need to go heavily shielded at all times. Also, it was likely true that making sense of thought and the processes thereof might not be quite so simple as running one's eye down a printed page. Linked to Paddy as he was, he felt her very clearly indeed. Now that her little burst of temper had burned away, she was admirably cool. That was good. A cool head was a useful commodity in trade, as it was in life. He walked around the corner in her wake, Vanner behind him, alert, but not alarmed. The space between the two bins was a short cul-de-sac, with a single bin at the far end, sealed rather than open, with wares on display. It seemed an odd state and an odder location for a specialty bin, but then Broker Plichette himself seemed to be rather odd. The brokerage did well, according to its publicly available financials, but Plichette would surely not be the only broker. Perhaps he was kin, or some other person who required oversight and occupation while being kept out of harm's way. Trader Yoskalen, there you are, the man said as Paddy approached. It was on me that you'd decided the walk was too far and had given up on me and my goods. I am curious to see what you have on offer, Paddy said. However, I am not so long-legged as you, sir. 
Her voice, Sean noted with approval, was calm. It also carried a chill edge, which he approved of less. A bit of humor might play better here, but the child would learn. And calmness was most important. That's right, a slim slip of a girl is what you are, the broker said. And something sharp flicked against Sean's healer senses. Ah, was this it? Had Paddy's sass at yesterday's reception not amused him so very much after all? But here, now that we're all together, let's take a look at what I have for you, trader. Tell me you can resist this. He flung the bin's cover wide and stepped back, both arms sweeping toward the goods on display, which were... Oh dear, Sean thought, holding himself very still. One would need to do a hand inspection to be positive, but upon first glance, the rugs hanging limply on the display rods were the rankest imitation Visrathans he had ever had the misfortune to lay eyes on. He could only thank the gods that Lucan was not present. He might have gone blind on the spot. Paddy. When she was younger, Paddy had trained with Lucan at his shop on Solcintra Port, as had Quinn, as he himself had done, and all of his generation of Corval too. Paddy knew the difference between a good rug and a bad rug, never mind between a genuine rug and an imitation. Paddy also knew when she had been insulted. He felt her outrage as if it were his own. Nor ought Broker Plichette be in doubt regarding the trader's state of mind, given the tight shoulders and the head held just so. Oh dear, Sean thought again. Not that he blamed her in the least. He looked to the links that bound them with an especial care for any glimpses of stone or violent eruption of power. He found temper, which was expectable. He tasted grit, which was sadly not unusual in this linkage, but there seemed to be no increase. Nor did he have any sense of walls a-trembling. Very well, then. The trader had the floor. He remanded himself to silence and awaited developments. Oh, so that was the game, was it? A test for the slim slip of a girl, for the stranger on the port who had perhaps been a little too forward in pointing out the errors of his thought. She was to be exposed as a fraud, no, as a child who had apparently never seen a proper rug in all her life, much less received the tutoring of a master. She drew in a deep breath and deliberately relaxed, as if she were about to sit her boards. Sadly, sir, I can resist it easily if this is your special offering, she said coolly, and saw his face change, the broad, false smile becoming a little rigid. Good, let him feel insulted. She walked forward to the bin itself. The broker stood fast at the side, watching her. Gently, because she really did fear for the weave, she took the closest rug between her hands. The nap was gritty and unpleasant against her palms, while the underside was flat and hard, innocent of even the most rudimentary nodding. Despite what her fingers told her, she flipped the rug over. If this were a test, then let the man see she knew where to look, what to look for, and how. Let him, in fact, wonder if she believed the business to be in earnest. She sighed at the slight shine on the flat underside of the rug, resin or glue. The fringe, the fringe as stiff as straw. Had this dreadful farce been a real Visrathen carpet, the fringe would have flowed through her fingers like water. But there, 
No one was pretending that these were real Visrathen carpets, or even very good imitations. She licked the fingertips of her right hand and rubbed them gently over the nap. They came away smeared purple, and she sighed. Neither the red nor the blue dyes were stable, and the gods alone knew what sort of fabric they'd used. A blend, if she was required to produce a guess, a blend of recycled plastics and waste wool. The wool would hold the dyes, but a high percentage of plastic to fabric would give the dye no purchase. Patty dropped the rug and turned to face Broker Plichette. She raised her hand, showing him the stained fingertips, and shook her head. Surely, sir, there are local haulers who can remove this for you far more cheaply than I. Do you insult my wares, trader? He sounded curious, not angry, and his face was calm. She reached into her pocket for a cloth and used it leisurely to clean her fingers. I think rather that the case is otherwise, Broker, she said, tucking the cloth away and looking him squarely in the face. If I were inclined to be pricklish, I might assume that you were seeking to discredit me. His mouth tightened, but he said nothing. However, she continued, trying for father's tone of gentle idiocy and doubtless missing, since I am not pricklish, I incline toward the belief that you were testing me to find if I was worthy of handling your actual goods. May I suggest that the master trader's schedule is very tight and that we would all benefit from a speedy showing of those goods that you in fact wish to bring to my attention. Silence stretched so long that she thought the stupid broker would refuse the saving of face she offered him. Then, abruptly, he smiled, closed the bin, and moved his arm, indicating that she should precede him out of the cul-de-sac. Please, trader, after you. The true goods are close by. The true goods were revealed to be honest and serviceable cotton rugs, hand-painted with vegetable dyes that had been fixed and then washed to take out the fixative and any extra dye. They were large and light and pleasant, with agreeable designs ranging from abstracts to quite realistic paintings of gardens and what seemed to be the very same mountains they could see from their suite. Paddy purchased a gross, which was modest enough at a price that was not, perhaps, absolutely as low as she might have gotten, but certainly low enough to ensure a reasonable profit. Unless, Sean thought wryly, the whole lot of them melted during transit. He took careful note of Broker Plichette's emotions. The man had apparently been certain that he would catch the upstart young trader with those terrible rugs. He seemed not quite as irritated with the fact that he had not caught her as Sean might have expected, but perhaps he was not a naturally warm man. The real question was why Broker Plichette had even made the attempt to discredit trader Jos Gallen. Certainly, he might have found it necessary to preserve his dignity at the reception in the midst of his peers, many of whom had been witnesses to the exchange. But there had been no reason at all to agree to meet with the cause of his embarrassment when she called to propose a meeting. Surely his discomfort could just as easily be assuaged by refusing to meet with her and therefore withholding his wares and her profit. Sean sighed. Well, perhaps he had assumed that he would dine out on the story. Paddy had comported herself well throughout, managing her temper and broker Plichette with equal skill. He owned himself pleased as her master and as her father, while admitting in the privacy of his own head that he 
might not have let the broker off quite so easily. Now then, trader, your goods will be delivered to your ship's cargo holding area. More than that, a master info key and a catalog of samples will be sent directly to you at your lodgings. You'll be able to make as many keys as you'd like to off the master. Thank you, Paddy said, standing up from the signing table. Now, I know you will forgive me for rushing away. I am, as I said, at service of the master trader, who has a very full schedule. Of course you are. No need to tarry with our business concluded, now is there? Thank you, trader, master trader, for taking the time out of those busy schedules to visit with me. Here now, let me show you the door. We hope to see you often trading here on Langlast Port. That last was an utter lie, which left Sean to wonder why the man bothered. It would be interesting, he thought, as they were ushered toward the entranceway, to find if all the merchants of Langlast Port felt the same way. During his early contacts with Jeeves, the elder AI had encouraged Admiral Bunter to avail himself of fiction. Fiction will illuminate behavior with an intensity and a veracity that research texts and facts alone cannot convey. Neither is a substitute for the other, but taken together, they enhance understanding. Alone in his shredding environments, Admiral Bunter had not had the leisure to take his elders' advice. Now, he had leisure. And... He had need. And he had a vast library, which had been part of the cranium's furnishings. He accessed the fiction module, using the keywords melanti, balance, honor, and necessity, which returned results, many more results than he had, in his ignorance of the form, anticipated. There were indeed many volumes entitled Melanti Plays. A play was a fictional form which was told in physical movement and spoken word by humans, for the enjoyment of other humans, so much he knew. There were tapes in the archives of such performances, if he cared to view them. Under the orders of protocol, to find a way other than the traditional, to allow Tolly Jones to answer questions, the Admiral rather thought that he ought to view at least some of these so-called Melanti plays. However, he had discovered that nonfiction was tiered. Some was informative, the supporting research strong, and the conclusions solidly constructed. Other nonfiction, he was beginning to form the opinion that this could be stated as most nonfiction, was less than informative, or it was derivative, or the research was shoddy, or the conclusions ill-drawn. It was therefore necessary to cross-ref, and in some cases cross-check sources and conclusions, reading several papers on a particular subject before forming an opinion of one's own. The Admiral supposed that fiction was no different from non-fiction in this regard, and he did not wish to waste time, of which he had not much, before Tolly Jones debarked and Admiral Bunter was alone. Therefore, faced with the plentitude of Melanti plays on offer, he turned again to non-fiction, looking for a source, a key, to those plays that were most illuminating of the human condition. Nor did research fail him. He found it almost at once. Square Truth, the 144 most influential Melanti plays, written by Patrick S. Bagley, professor of exotic art forms, who was, according to the information in the file, an expert in the field of Melanti plays, having devoted his life to their study. 
for which he had won acclaim from other scholars of the field. This, then, was his source book. He would choose his plays based on this illustrious expert's advice. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Jugowitz. And a grove of ripe sloes, a field of GMO wheat that actually flowers with perfectly brown pieces of toast and a knife to spread with. Together with thanks and buttery praise to DJ Butler, author of Witchy Winter. Please join us next time here at the Hammering Heart of Science Fiction and Fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs>